Not extra exactly, but I will let you have it. Oh, we'll, we'll, all, we'll all gather around the Hermes. I really like the word focus. Isn't that nice? Yeah. Good, good, thank you. <coughs> in, my, in my universe. All of this, all of this <clears throat> rise of empiricism comes out of one man. <clears throat> and with it came its hostility to Platonic metaphysics. What's the issue cause? Let me open it this way. Uh, <clears throat> Let's assume we have a very fine motion picture that's capable of shooting <clears throat> a thousand frames per second. And the object is in motion. Mm -hmm. right. Would you be able to pick out one of the frames and say, here's the cause? Mm, no. The, the question is, how do you understand this idea of cause? The assumption is, hey, The film tries to capture <laughs> physical phenomena. <clears throat> like this, okay? Oh. Huh? That's all. You're looking at each one of the frames and you're looking for cause. 
Can you come to the conclusion based upon sense experience that there is a cause to anything that you see in motion or generated? That's your issue. Is the idea of cause metaphysical? What? It's a cause, a metaphysical word, <coughs> term, <coughs> that is not part of the empirical phenomena that you experience. Mm. Hey, look here. <clears throat> the person most linked to this whole thing is our good friend, David Jung. All right, here it is. He said, you know what? Whatever you look at that's in motion, the only thing you can conclude is that there are patterns in your experience. What he means by patterns is repeated similar events. So, like, look, you know, again and again and again, right? You have something similar, repeats itself again and again. <clears throat> That's your experience. He says, you know what? It's only because you experience it again and again and again and again that you insert the idea of cause. And in reality, what you really have is similar events occurring again and again, and therefore you're going to assign the idea of cause to explain that similarity that you experience. You're going to insert it in it. It has no reality. It has no reality. That's what you do. You're foolish. It's not part of your experience. Now he goes the next step and he says, hey, you know what? You don't need it. Well, there are correlations. Under similar circumstances, similar things take place. That's all cause is. Under similar circumstances, you just have expectations and they come forward. Therefore, you conclude, and conclude that's the cause. He said, in reality, throw out the word cause. It's not part of your experience. All you really have is correlations, that's all. So now he goes and he says, you know what? I'm going to tell you something. The idea of cause is often used in religious literature. And therefore it is assumed God is the cause of a particular phenomena that you're looking at. Now look here, if you want to say that God is the cause of a particular event, and if you want to use your mind, all you have to do is first, you have to be aware of the nature of God and uh, be able to grasp um, what it is he wills. You have to be able to see that it's not an accident, but that God willed it. Now, if there's going to be a miracle, such as the blind re retrieve their sight, then you should be able to have 
right? You, you should be able to pin down exactly the force that proceeded from God's will and affected the physiology of this blind man and be able to take a look at that physiological change and show by a very tight line of reasoning that you can attribute to the fact that God will do. That's all. He says, you know what? It's impossible. It's impossible. Who can actually say, hey, I know the will of God. I've experienced it. See, Tom, I experienced it. I saw the fact that God willed it in a particular fashion. And then, even though he willed it, there has to be some power that proceeds from that will. And you have to be able to, to see it sequentially, all the way down to the particular, and see its effect neurophysiologically. I should look here. There is only one reason you can ever say a miracle is true. That's all. He says, you know what? What you need is data. Let's say there are a whole bunch of people who witness this. Therefore, from that experience of witnessing it, there should be a, a whole mountain, as it were, of data. He said, it's only, it's only when that mountain of data is greater than the presumed miracle, then you can say it took place. He said, therefore, that's a greater miracle. The, the complete and adequate field of data, cumulatively, interrelated, all point to the same thing in the same way. It would be a mountain of data. It's only when it would be a greater mystery. Right? Which is greater, the event or this event? It's only when this over, overwhelmingly is superior to that event, then you can say that event took place. What a fool. Multiple corroboration. Principle that is yours in. Multiple corroboration of many witnesses confirming the same event happens in the same way under similar circumstances, and all of those accounts can fit together into a unity. It's only then that you can say that totality of data has to be of such a nature that it is even greater than the original miracle than it took place. I have a feeling your Uncle Louie is in that group. So. Pardon? <laughs> I'm just saying in that group of people who are always giving their, even the multiple, uh, the multiple collaboration um, and many people giving stories about this is what happened, this is what happened, and then you take that and that, that mountain of data and I just, for some reason, I pictured your Uncle Louie in that group of people. Well, let's push it one more step. Some people think they have a self. Self-identity. That's a myth. They're not self-identity. Why is it a myth? For the same reasoning. What mountain of evidence would you have to have in place such that to deny it would be a greater miracle than the establishing the fact is true? That's all. Therefore, cause is a myth, self is a myth, miracles are a myth. The very notion, therefore, of cause and effect can be dismissed. What's the assumption now? The assumption is... That you can't access cause, right? Worse than that, there ain't any. Right. Well, I thought his, I thought David Hume's position was that if there was or wasn't, we wouldn't be able to know because it's, it's from metaphysical 
secured vault or something like that. Like the, the springs and mechanisms and... Yeah, but now you have to ask yourself, is it possible, is it conceivable that you could have such a mountain of evidence? Where all the witnesses and all the data you collect fit together, each one in harmony with the other? So. Therefore? It's an impossible... Impossible. Wait, isn't there, Pierre, isn't there one exception to that? Um, and, and I know you're a million times better read up on this than I am. Ah, don't worry about it. I was just reading, a, I was just watching a great YouTube documentary today. I got five minutes into it, and they're talking about how science denies consciousness. And the physicist from MIT says that the problem that physicists, that, that most physicists have, is what the quantum physicists discovered around the teens and the 20s, of course, which is that when there is an observer, uh, it has an effect on the wave of whatever they're measuring. It stops the wave and sort of reboots it. That's how we put it. And they can't explain why that happens, but all they do is sort of deny it, walk away, and make all their experiments uh, have no observers in them. In fact, they, if they can, they'll send the scientist out of the room, right? That's right. Um, so to, to, to force themselves to design experiments in such a way ever since they discovered that problem, they at least have to recognize that effect. No, no. And if they recognize that effect, is that not the mountain of evidence since every observer affects the thing in the same way? Yeah. Look here. Um, <clears throat> is that See, not the crux yeah, of the yeah, let, right there? Yeah, let me help you with something. Um, <laughs> I would like to see whether we can get a number of people to sign a petition that I want to distribute. And I'd like a donation as you sign it, of course. So I hope you bring enough money as you sign my petition. Oh, yeah, I have to tell you about what it is. Yeah. I want to outlaw right. The left is okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and middle is okay. Right. And in the same way, um, I've been looking up for many years for the ideal mountain mm -hmm. because I like walking. There should be a mountain that only has one side, which is down. <laughs> so if we do away with right and up and Right? Then everything will be peaceful. Then we can just always walk downhill so there won't be any trouble. We won't need all of these locomotives. It'll always be down. It just coast. So this petition will go around and uh, hope you sign it. Oh, or if you do away with cause, they ain't got effect. They're correlated. If one goes, the other goes. Did you say effect? Effect. Therefore, there are, no, there are no effects if there are no causes. Just things happen. <laughs> They're not effects because that presupposes. Uh, ain't got none. You didn't have any children? Okay, one more step. Okay. <laughs> See? All of this, all of this naturally takes place within you. All experience, you finally experience in the mind only. There's no evidence, therefore, of an external world. Right, because everything you experience, you experience in your mind. Is it locationally in? Well, because everything you experience, where do you experience it? In your mind. Right. That's right. No. So there isn't any external world, because there's no internal world. There's no self. So it's all neurophysiological, it's in the mind.
Oh, uh, by the way, this brilliant gentleman, at the end of the book, that yeah, makes two points. And he looks at this and he says, under what condition can we say this is true? Well, he never asked me, but I, I would tell him. Because he does, you know, he actually does admit it. See, it's the problem. Do you ever have a girlfriend, you wonder what's on her mind? Now, I sell a three-inch drill. And you can, you know, <laughs> then you can use one of these dentist mirrors, you know, and stick it in there and take a look at what's on her mind. Right? I don't, that only works on women, by the way. Yeah. Men don't have anything on their Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one more step. Look here. Everyone is like this. How do you know this is true? That's easy. You see, you have, to, you have to find a way to get a drill, to drill a hole, <laughs> so that you can then see the correspondence between this and the external world. Then that confirms that it is in your mind. Oh, but by the way, but if everything is in your mind, and that's all you ever experienced. Can you ever get out of it? No. Can you get out of it? No. His solution to this problem is really great. And therefore, I recommend you reading the book. Right? Essays in Human Understanding. He said, there's some questions you can't answer. Only stupid people ask them. And this is one of them. Therefore, don't ask it. That's a, that's, it's, I wonder who told him that. When he that's what he said. He said, you know what? This is the kind of a question that's unanswerable. Therefore, don't ask it. Therefore, you can't confirm it. You can't even ask the question with him because well, it's impossible. Well, from even the question. Right? So, hey, again, What's the first assumption? His assumption is that people should discover in the sequence of events cause. He says, no, you can't because all you really have is similar events occurring again and again from which you infer cause and you don't need to. That's the problem. So, Okay, now we're going to look at the idea of cause in Plato. There isn't any ancient philosopher who assumes what he assumes, and that is that causes are, causes are present in phenomenal existence in everyday world, in the physical world. No one says that. He assumed that to create his argument. So let's take a look at what Plato does in the Phaedo. 501, 502, right? What's this to Uh 96, uh, 97-ish. It should be, shouldn't it be 500? Oh, 500, okay, I can change it with this. Which is making about 95B, 96 okay. A, B. Okay, let's take a look, take a minute out, take a look at it. You're in the, you're in the lower place. How does it begin? How does it begin? Yeah, I'm going to find it right now. Um, 96AB, listen then and I will tell you. 
the last paragraph of page three. Read it. Yes, you got a nice section. Pick it up from Anaxagoras. Well, do you want to start there? Yeah, good place. Oh, that's different. No, no, no. If you have a better place, I'll take yours. Okay. <clears throat> um. I'm going to start at the paragraph above the one I just mentioned, David. Socrates was silent for some time, thinking to himself. Then he said, That is no trifle you seek, Cebes. We are bound to discuss generally the cause of generation and destruction. If you allow me, I will run through my own experience in these matters. Then if anything of what I shall say seems useful, you shall use it to prove whatever you may say. I'm using the translation that's available for me. Do you want, in this handy browse. Would you like to read, read the Balboa translation? Not particularly. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you guys are going to run right into the problem of understanding through an inferior translation. If people want me to. Why are you using an inferior translation? I will. Because 90% of the people have that text. Well, yeah, but. The, She's I, making a case for Balboa. I, if you're into Balboa's translation, yes, that's rebellious. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I gather. No, 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 no. Come on. Please give. Yeah. <clears throat> Notice the difference. Yeah, go ahead. But your question is answered. It is no thoughtless matter that you seek, O CDs, for the cause of generation and destruction needs to be wholly and thoroughly investigated. Thus I, if, you, if indeed you wish, will give to you my personal experience in these matters. Thereupon, should something which I say may appear useful to you, make use of it to persuade us of that which you say. Keep going. But I truly do indeed wish that, says Stevie. Listen, man. You want to read it? No, I don't have it. Listen then, as I tell you, O Cedis, for when I was young, I was in a wonderful condition, as I was eager to possess that wisdom, which indeed they call the study of physics. For it appeared to me to be a splendid thing to know the causes of each thing. Through what does each thing come to be? And through what does it dissolve? And through what does it in and through what does it remain in existence? And often I myself changed up and down in the investigation with questions such as these. In the first place, whenever living creatures are being formed, does it really happen whenever heat and cold bring about some decay, as some say? And whether it happens through the blood or through the air or through fire or or on the one hand, if it is through none of these by which we have mind, or on the other hand, if it is the brain which produces the perceptions of hearing and of sight and of smell, then out of these the memory comes to be and opinion. Then out of memory and opinion, quietness takes hold. Then out of this quietness, knowledge comes into being and in turn by investigating how these perish and what happens to things in heaven and on the earth in this way finally I myself came to believe that I was naturally unsuited for this kind of investigation by being in no way useful but I will give you sufficient proof of this for at that time I was severely blinded by this investigation of what I clearly knew then and also of what I knew before, as it appeared to both myself and others. It was as if I had been unlearned, and even of those things I thought I knew before, about many other things, and specifically, through what do men grow? Since before this happened, I thought it was obvious to everyone 
that it was through eating and drinking that men grow. For whenever, on the one hand, he adds flesh to flesh from the food he eats, and on the other hand, he adds bones to bones, and in this way, according to the same line of reasoning, other parts were also added to each of the other appropriate parts of the body. Then, from having a lesser mass at that time before, he has now become a greater mass. And in this way, the smaller man becomes greater. I thought in this way at that time. Does it not appear to you that I believed in a measured way? Yeah. Then please still consider the following, for I thought that my opinion was sufficient. That whenever a tall man appeared standing by a short man, he was taller by a head. And that a horse was taller than a horse in the same way. And even more manifestly clear than these examples, indeed it appeared to me, that 10 was more than eight because two had been added to them. And that a two cubit length is larger than a cubit because it surpasses it by half of it. <coughs> CB says, well, what then truly appears to you now about those things? Well, by Zeus, I am so far from thinking that I know the cause of those events of which I will not even allow myself to say regarding the meeting of neighbors with each other, that when anyone is added to one, either the one to which the addition was made has become two, or the one which was added, or the one added, and the one which was added to become two, because of the addition to one of one to the other, for I wonder if on the one hand, when each of them was separate from each other, each was accordingly one, and they were not at that time two, but that on the other hand, when they were brought nearer to one another, this itself became the cause of their becoming two. Nor indeed can I any longer be, be persuaded that when any one is divided, that the division itself has become in turn the cause of its being enabled to become two. For this becomes the opposite to the cause which became two at that time. For on the one hand, at that time, that came to be by bringing them near each other and by adding the one to the other. But now, on the other hand, that happens because one is taken away and separated from the other. According to the manner of this investigation, Neither can I still persuade myself that I indeed know through what a unit exists or how anything else either comes to be or perishes or remains in existence by this one method. But since I have yet another mixed up manner of investigation that is familiar to me, in no way will I ever accept that method. I'm going to keep going. Go After you. So then one day upon hearing someone reading, as he said, from a book of Anaxagoras, <clears throat> So then one day upon hearing someone reading, as he said, from a book of Anaxagoras, and proclaiming that it is because of mind that the cosmos is ordered and is the cause of all, that I was truly delighted with this cause. And in some way, it appeared to me to contain the correct manner that mind should contain as the cause of all. And it led me to believe that if this were the case, that if the mind orders, then surely it would have to direct everything and arrange each thing in the best way that this should be in. If then one wished to find the cause of each thing, in what way it comes to be or perishes or remains in existence, it would be necessary to discover what was the best way for this itself to be in, or should be in, or to be acted upon by another, or to act. Truly then, out of this method, what is either excellent or best, and out of no other, is it proper for man to investigate about this and other things? Necessarily then, the same method must also recognize what is inferior, subordinate, for these things belong to the same knowledge. 
One more step, please. As I reasoned about these ways, I believed that I had truly discovered in Anaxagoras the master of the cause of reality, according to my own familiar way of thinking, and that he would tell me first on the one hand whether the earth is flat or round, and when he had told me this, then on the other hand he would thoroughly explain not only the cause but also the necessity by explaining which is the better one and that it was better to be in, a, in such a way. And if he said it was in the middle, then he would thoroughly explain that it was better for it to be in the middle. And if he would have revealed these things to me, I was then prepared never again to long for another kind of cause. And I was truly prepared to learn by inquiry in the same way about the sun and the moon and the other heavenly bodies in this same way about the, their speed and revolutions relative to each other and whatever else happened to them in whatever way at any time each active or passive condition is better. For I never would have thought that Anaxagoras who indeed asserted that these things have been under the direction of mind would bring in any cause for them other than that they are best maintained in this way, just as they have been. Then once he had assigned the cause to each and to all things in common, I thought he would go on to thoroughly explain what is best for each thing and the common good for all. And I would not have given up my hopes for a fortune. So I very eagerly acquired his books, reading them as quickly as I was able to in order to know the best and the inferior as quickly as I was able to. Truly then that wonderful hope was taken away. Oh, companion and gone from me from the first time that I proceeded to read. Since on the one hand I saw the man made no use of the intellect nor did he charge it with any responsibility for the management of affairs. But on the other hand, charged as causes, air and ether and water and many other absurd causes. And that seemed to me to have been affected in the very same way as one who would say that all the actions of Socrates would be due to mind. But then in trying to explain the causes of each thing that I do, First says on the one hand that I am now sitting here because of this my body is composed out of bones and sinews and on the other hand the bones are solid and are separated by joints from each other. But on the other hand the sinews are, are such as to stretch and relax surrounding the bones along with the flesh and skin by which they are held together. Thus as the bones are hung in their own sockets that slacken and tighten of the sinews, I suspect, and enable me to bend my joints as I do at the present time. And that through this cause, I happen to be sitting here with my legs crossed together. And that in turn, mention other causes concerning our discourse with each other, such as sounds and air, hearing and hearing and countless other such causes, while thoughtlessly failing to mention as the actual cause that ever since it appeared better to the Athenians for me to be condemned, and truly through this, it has appeared better to me in turn to sit here, and that it was more just to remain here to undergo the sentence they should order. Otherwise, as it seems to me at least, by the dog, these sinews and bones would have been on their way towards Megara or Boeotia being carried by the opinion of what is the best course, if I did not know, that it is more just and more beautiful to undergo any sentence the city may order instead of running away and escaping. But on the one hand, to call such things causes is quite absurd. But on the other hand, if someone said that without having such things and bo such things and bones and sinews and other things as far as I have, I would not be able to do that which seemed proper to me. He would be right. But surely to say that it is because of these that I do that which I do and do these things with intelligence, but not with a view to that which is best. Speak up a little more. Sorry. 
hard to read. Let me start with this uh, back here. That should make one more point. Do you want me to here? No. To say that it is because of these that I do that which I do and do these things with intelligence, but not with a view to that which is best, would be to speak in a prodigiously indifferent manner. For not being able to discern, on the one hand, that that which is the cause in reality is very different, while on the other hand, that the good without which the cause would not ever be the cause is another. Do it again. And that without which the cause would not ever be the cause is another. What does that mean? Got it? Say it again. Okay. What you're reading. The, the cause. And that which is the cause in reality is very different. While on the other hand, that without which the cause would not ever be the cause is another. Is quite another. Hmm. Yours? Um, Same line. Is this Rouse? Yes. Yeah, David, go ahead. But to say that those things are the cause of my doing what I do and that I act with intelligence but not from choice of what is best would be an extremely careless way of thinking. Whoever talks in that way and una is unable to make a distinction and to see what in reality a that in reality a cause is one thing and the thing without which the cause could never be a cause is quite another. Right. What is that mean? That uh, the cause is the good. Yes. All things, the, the only cause is the good. That's right. The cause is one thing, but that without, without which... That not without which a cause could not be a... Yeah. yeah what is that? The good. I think that this is where we got tripped up before. If we go back in the discussion, isn't it the bones and the sinews? Right? Like Socrates thinks it's best for him to stay there. He calls that a cause. Yeah. But if he didn't have bones and sinews, that cause could couldn't be a cause. Right? Um, unless unless there was a good, good implicit in what is going on. Yeah, I, I see it differently than that. Oh, well, let's do it. Well, it's just... <clears throat> see, actually, we, we need one more step. Uh, he has to make one more point. He does that about beauty. Could you read it further? Yeah. Can I? What's the longest number in that? It's about 99 C now, about a little bit before 99 C. Yeah, go ahead and expand that. Huh? Yeah, she's got it. What sentence did you want to read, or did you want to go on? What were you trying so to that, get? Without which the cause would never be a cause, would not ever be the cause, is another. And that which the majority truly appear to me to do, just as if they were groping in the dark when they call it opinion, a cause thus imposing a foreign name to it. And hence, on the one hand, one man surrounds the earth with a vortex under heaven to make the earth remain securely in its place, while on the other hand, another stretches out the air to overlook it as if he were a wide abyss. But since they neither investigate the power by which they are now disposed in the best possible way, nor do they believe it has a spiritual force, but they are led to believe that they will find at some time a stronger and more immortal latter day atlas to hold everything together even more. And they neither believe that the good truly and necessarily binds and holds them together. 
No, what is it that binds and holds everything together? The good. The good. The good. Yeah, go ahead. So on the one hand, I would have gladly become the disciple of any man who may have possessed in some way, at some time, that kind of cause. But on the other hand, since I was deprived of this, and neither did I myself discover this, nor did I happen to learn of such a nature from another, do you wish for me to give you a demonstration of the search with which I busied myself in my second quest for the cause, OCBs? Would I not? More than anything else in the world. Would you like to read, Kevin? Now then, after this, when I had averted my search from natural existence, it appeared to me that I must necessarily be careful to avoid that very experience of those who watch and look upon an eclipse of the sun, for some of them may ruin their eyes if they do not look at the image of the self in water or some, something like this. And I envisioned something such as this happening to me, and I feared that my soul may be altogether blinded if I were to look at realities with my eyes and if I tried to grasp selves with each of my senses. It appeared to me then that I must necessarily take refuge in the Logos and in those seek the truth of real beings. Uh, sorry, the Logos is, that, that's plural, the Logos. And then in those seek the truth of real beings. Thus, on the one hand, Perhaps the image which I liken is not done in a fitting way, for I do not at all grant that one who seeks realities in the Logos is concerned with images any more than one who seeks them in deeds. But surely then I did begin in this way by also using the Logos as a hypothesis in each case, which I discerned to be the most sound. I would on the one hand consider as being true about cause and about every other real being, which appeared, to me, which appeared to me to be in tune with this Logos, and on the other hand, consider as not true uh, whatever was not. But I want to make my meaning even more clear to you, for I believe that you do not yet learn. Indeed, I do not. Not well. Yeah, but it's nothing new. What I mean is this. What, but what it is all, uh, sorry. What I mean is this, but it is also just as always what I have never stopped saying in the earlier Logos and at other times. For I am truly going to try to set out to demonstrate to you the idea of the cause which I have busied myself. And I will refer back to those oft-murmured songs and begin from them by hypothesizing that a certain beauty exists, capital E, self according to self, and the good and the great and all the others, which if you willingly grant me and also agree that they exist, then as a result, I hope to demonstrate that you will discover the cause that the soul is immortal. Surely then take it as being granted to you and do not tarry with its fulfillment. Consider then the next thing in order that if it appears to you as it does to me, for for it has come to light for me that if there is anything whatsoever that is beautiful, besides the beautiful itself, it is beautiful by no other one than because it partakes of that beauty. And surely then I say that it is in this way with everything, and surely then I say that it is in this way with everything. Do you agree there is such a cause? Okay, what did he just say? That's the final point. Yeah, the participation is the point of participation. Yeah, come on, take a look. He's using the example of beauty. Mm -hmm. Beauty itself is and the And beauty only itself cause. is the cause. Pardon? Beauty itself is the cause, right? The cause of what? Of beautiful things. Ah. No, what makes beautiful things beautiful is simply that they partake in beauty itself. Right? right, isn't that the cause? Am I missing it? I thought that was the cause. Okay, this is why he's called us here together. Yeah. Their participation in beauty the cause. I thought, I thought, okay. What does he have to add to that? 
from the previous argument. What, yes, that's true. The idea of participation? Or, I mean, the, the account of participation? That it has to conform to the logos? Yes. Come on, more? Come on, come on, come on. Liquor. And, and if you do see it, you have to see, as a result, that this makes things to be the best possible way in which things can be. And it, the logos reflects that. That's right. Yeah. Right. right. So, How does he say it? By the way, can you do that? Do what? Um, picture you're going through uh, all of the 20th century concentration camps and gulags, right? See all the bodies lined up and all the destruction and the fury. What does this presuppose? That there's a, a good. That's right. The best. There's a best possible. That's right. What What does concentration camps have to do with best? <laughs> given the whole, given the whole, finish it. It was best to go through that in some way. You have to go through that for the best outcome. So therefore we need to read someone who can justify the destruction that took place in all the 20th century and show that it is ultimately for the best that that took place. Yep. Yeah. And it's consistent with a logos, a rational dis defense of it. Yeah. And it must therefore show the presence of the good. Couldn't. Right? Problem B. And it's all pulled together by one word, participation. Yeah. So That's what he calls a cause. Right. So what is the cause again? Oh, you did, problem. Did you, did you get that? Is participation the cause or beauty the cause? Yeah. <laughs> but your choice of imagery really sucks. So, me and Ingmar have a question. Ingmar and I have a question. Is participation the cause or beauty the cause? I th said beauty the cause. He. Yeah, well, I'll just. He, he likes to read the text. No, I like I'm to, you know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Because, <laughs> because it partakes of beauty. Be cause, right? Yeah. What do you think of that? Come on. Because it partakes of beauty, that doesn't tell me that the participation is the source of the cause. It, does, it doesn't tell you that. So, what's what the cause of the particip you? What makes it participate? Only, it, be, only because <laughs> it's, the best possible, it's the best possible way in which things can exist. So, so it's impossible for it not to participate because that's the best possible way for it to unfold in existence. Yes and no. There's some things that are beyond participation, but he doesn't deal with that, except in this idea of beauty. But leave that out. So, okay, so just finish my... So what is the cause? The cause is... You fill in the rest of the sentence. The cause is... No, no, come on. Participation? No, no. Yes, I have one thing, but I still don't see. Are you so participation is the cause? Uh, that's what I'm like, no. saying. Okay. See, is, is, gonna... is the idea of participation here? <clears throat> he doesn't have any theory about why beautiful things become beautiful as a result of beauty. Does he use the idea of participation in that sentence? It, it says partakes. God, read it. Yeah. What, uh, I lost the sentence. Can oh, you read? Yeah, yeah. What appears to me is that if anything else is beautiful besides beauty itself, what makes it beautiful, what makes it beautiful is simply that it partakes of that beauty. And so I say with everything. What makes it beautiful is that it partakes of that beauty. I see that as beauty being the cause, not participation. I'll think about it. I'll come back. <laughs> So can I go back to the 
our sentence that I think basically covers that. For it shows the inability to distinguish that the real cause is one thing and that without which the cause cannot be a cause is another. I mean, yeah. you basically saying there's, you can't separate them out. So I was, that says that participation is that which without the cause can't be the cause, but that the beauty itself is, the, is much different and it is the cause. Uh, I gotta look at it. I, I'm confused now. No, I, I'm not Ingmar. 20 years and you think I want to change a text? Come on. No, go back to the point. How important is it that there must be a logos that can explain that so that it can justify the fact that that participation is necessary and is for the best possible reason? I got no problem with that. I just don't see the word cause on that piece of paper. So, and, and Ingmar saying that participation is the cause. Oh, I've got another translation here. I think that if anything is beautiful besides absolute beauty, it is beautiful for no other reason than because it partakes of absolute beauty. And this applies to everything. Right. So it's beauty. It's not participating. Like you can't, partaking it does not make something beautiful. It's beauty that makes something beautiful through participation. Right? Right. That's what beauty is the cause. What's the, me what's the mechanism? Participation. Right. So that's not what Ingmar's saying. So I. He is saying that. You're both in agreement now. Oh, no. Are we in agreement? <laughs> oh, maybe we just. Oh, man, now I'm really confused. I thought we were not in agreement. But it's worse if you get it to the Greek. Kevin, why don't you go down to my fine lines where it says, yeah. you know, um, I hold on simply claiming perhaps simple mind lead to this. Mm hmm. Well, no, but that, yeah, that's the presence of beauty is the cause. Yeah. Yeah, so that's there's... Right. Presence there's see it. See, but keep in mind that what does that do to the idea of physical phenomena? <sighs> what, participation? A that's right. At best. <laughs> Pardon? I said a transient appearance at best. Yeah, uh, more. They go in and so, out. They go in and out. Look here. Here's ultimate reality. Yeah, there's something else that causes them to be you. Well, but there is, there is in every phenomena beauty itself. Then, therefore, hey. Presence, participation. Right. Well, presence, see? Presence. Presence. Yeah, presence. I like presence. Like it's like, then, this is not a cup. This is beauty itself. No, but is there then, in his view, any exclusive physical reality? No, I can't see it. That's right. I can't see it. Therefore? Therefore, there's only... The idea of physical reality? Is an appearance or is... Is appearance. An image? Because it's actually participation continuously. Uh -huh. Therefore, the divine is manifesting itself in the physical all the time. Yes. Therefore, there isn't any purely physical phenomena independent of the divine. Right. Because, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. It's the same. No. Rather clever, isn't it? Well, who? The one who created it? or? <laughs> so let me go back to David Hume. He starts... Oh, really? He starts his <laughs> argument, he starts his argument with saying we have to be careful because we live in a universe in which metaphysicians are hiding and they're ready to pounce upon the unsuspected and fill their head with nonsense. Therefore we must agree to avoid these people. Therefore, his last words is a great paragraph which everybody should memorize. Now, once you're persuaded of these principles, what should you do? You should run over to the libraries and pick up any book and ask whether it has anything to do with experiment and number. If it has nothing to do with experiment and number, just cast it in the into the flames, for it's all empty rhetoric.
So yeah, he's voting for Trump. Yeah. <laughs> that was so, they're both still groping. <laughs> I know he's got a lot of mileage out of empty rhetoric. So, so but uh, that wouldn't be so bad if his idea of number was a bit loftier. Well, yeah. the nice thing about number, all you're dealing with is one. Right. No. That's all number is, is no one. Agree? Yes. Good. Thank you, guys. Any men in the last word? Thank you, Pierre. Thank you, Bob. You my old days, I would so not have let that stand. Yeah, well, I would let what? I would not let stand. Let what stand? That the concentration camps in some way demonstrate the best possible. Well, it may.